Welcome to A Look Ahead. If you've had a chance to watch us before, you know that this is a program about the Sabbath school lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, that are they're studied weekly. Um, this is a series for the second quarter of 2012 entitled Witnessing and Evangelism. And this particular lesson is lesson number nine entitled Releasing into Ministry. What do you suppose that means? Releasing into ministry. We'll find out in a moment, but we'd always like to start with a word of prayer. If you'll bow your heads with us, we'll pray. Our loving Father, we come once again seeking a better knowledge of your plans for us, of exactly what you want us to do in terms of witnessing and, and, and evangelism. Give us the fire in our bones that makes us want to go out and do something for you. Give us guidance to, to the right people who, who are ready to respond and help us to say the right words is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson talks about available resources, about obstacles that might pop up, about hindrances that are always there, and then the final preparation before you actually go out and begin that program of evangelism or witnessing in the church. It should be pretty clear if you've had a chance to listen to several of the lessons we've done so far, that for a church to grow, it needs intentional witnessing and evangelism. These things don't just happen by accident. Now, once in a while, it may be true that you're riding in a public transport or something like this, and people says, you know, what do you think about God or something like that? But that's pretty rare. So basically, if the church is going to grow, we need to find ways intentionally to go out and evangelize. And that requires some planning. It's, if it's going to be really successful, it requires some planning. So what about your church? Is there a definite plan that has been worked out? Ways to involve members at all levels, some doing this thing and some doing that thing, but organized together and coordinated to make the church go forward. Um, <clears throat> an example might be found in Exodus 18, starting with verse 13. If you remember the story, we haven't, we haven't come to the, the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 yet, Moses has just led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They have just watched the, the Egyptian army sink into the Red Sea. And they're moving down, and they're almost to Mount Sinai. Or perhaps they are at Mount Sinai by this time. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brings Moses' wife and his two children to, 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 to meet Moses, to, to join him out here, in, in, for at least for a little while. And he looks, and what's Moses doing? Remember? Settling disputes. He's spending the day from early in the morning to late at night trying to work out problems between different groups, settling disputes and so forth. And what did Jethro suggest? Well, he said you need to get some help here and, and diversify this decision making because it's going to kill you off. That's what he said. Well, Moses said, and I quote, I must do this because the people come to me and they want to know God's will. When two people have a dispute, they come to me and I decide which one of them is right and I tell them God's commands and laws. And Jethro said, you're not doing it the right way. You will wear yourself out and these people as well. This is too much for you to do alone. Now let me give you some good advice and God will be with you. It is right for you to pre represent the people before God and bring their disputes to him. But you should teach them God's commands and explain to them how they should live and what they should do. But in addition, you should choose some capable men and appoint them, and I'm not sure why he didn't mention women, capable men and appoint them as leaders of the people. Because of the day. Because of the day, okay. Leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They must be God-fearing men who can be trusted and who cannot be bribed. Very important, right? Let them serve as judges for the people on a permanent basis. They can bring all the difficult cases to you but they themselves can decide all the smaller disputes. That will make it easier for you as they share your burden. If you do this as God commands, how did Jethro know that this was God's command? <coughs> you will not wear yourself out and all these people can go home with their disputes settled. So what are we supposed to learn about evangelism from that passage? First of all, who's Jethro? Jethro was 
from the Midianites. The Midianites were uh, one of the other children of Abraham. Midian was one of the other children of Abraham. If you remember, there was, there was Ishmael, and then there was uh, Isaac. And then after Sarah died, he remarried a young lady by the name of Keturah. And she had five or six other children, and Midian was one of those. So these were also descendants of, of, um, of Abraham. But Jethro specifically was a priest among those people, a, apparently a, a faithful worshiper of God, and he's the one that Moses had fled to. It was one of his daughters that Moses married, and where he had lived with him for 40 years. Out so there. The father in law. This is Moses' father in law. He had a large family also, so he was used to how you had to organize. Probably. You had but to delegate. Could you say he was kind of a prophet? Well, he was, we're told that he was a priest. Priest, and it seems like he had a message from God from mm -hmm. Moses, yeah. which w is interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, what's How it? do we know this is from God? That's well, how do it said so. Yeah, well, how come it how said come that Jethro it? said so? How mm -hmm. come God didn't communicate? You know, God was pretty good at communicating with Moses. Why mm -hmm. didn't he? Come Just come straight and, forward. That's huh? right. You know, let's let's spread Stay things out here a little bit. And, mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jethro <laughs> must be worth something because God sent Moses to Jethro's area, his his in, and under his supervision, and and Moses married his daughter. So God must have thought good of Jethro. Yeah, doesn't mean that everything that Jethro came up with was good. No. <laughs> At the same time, you can bet that after forty years, these two men had learned how to work together. And I suspect, being this an Eastern tradition, I suspect that Moses was very respectful to his father-in-law. That would, that would be the normal ex you would expect from under those circumstances. We have no record that God disagreed with this organization. No, none whatsoever. And it seemed to work really well. Well, our, our court system today operates on this levels of uh, appellate decision mm -hmm. up to you get up to the top end. Well, you know, well, everything works that way. Everything is structured that way. All, all kinds of employment. There's, you know, there's things which are diversified and at each level there are people who have authority to make certain decisions and so on and so forth. It's a little surprising, especially with, you know, we say when Moses was raised in Egypt, he was raised, you know, to be a leader there mm -hmm. and all around all that kind of organization. You, you would, it's almost a little surprising. Did Moses have a little ego thing here going? Well, for, for us in evangelism, though, is the lesson that, that we can't do everything ourselves, that we need to organize and get layers of people? Well, that's the point here. What should we learn about evangelism here? What we should learn is that the pastor isn't the one who's supposed to do everything. That would certainly be the number one experience. And then we certainly make all the decisions. Well, he's not supposed to make all the decisions. No. He's supposed to have a group that works together, and they're supposed to plan together. And the, the more, the more the more, let's say, the more thoroughly that church, or more carefully that that group is, is chosen to be representative of the whole church group, the more likely the whole church is going to be involved. And why would, if you had these underlings, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know, below Moses, what would keep the people from going to them instead of going to the big guy? I mean, what happened? Oh, well, because it would be a lot easier. You don't have to stand on nearly as long a line to go to them. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, okay, a, a line would explain it. Yeah. You know, if you had somebody there that, maybe he could do it. You know, we don't have to wait so long. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is important to recognize that jo Moses was supposed to pick what kind of people? Very wise. Just anyone? People. Very wise. Oh. No, he tried it. Upright. I, I don't know how. He, we don't have Cannot details about how he. D what? Cannot be bribed. Yeah. One of the words. And they were supposed to be well qualified. So Moses probably went around to the the leaders of each tribe and said, "Help me pick out some people that are the best people in your group." So, what should we do in a in our church organization? We need to recognize who the who the people are who are skilled at doing this or that or the other. Uh, some women will be skilled at preparing potlucks, maybe. Other, you know, men might be more skilled at preparing Bible studies, if that's the case. Each person, the whole thing needs to be organized. How and the people are qualified to do each thing. 
need to be chosen. How can you, how can you be bribed oh, I see in the church or character. within the conference or within the union at those different layers? How, how would, is it how important to have people who can't be bribed? And if they could be is. bribed, how could they be bribed? Which office do you want? There's, <laughs> there's such a thing as politics too. If I if I was if I was elected to uh, a position like let's say, uh, uh, what would I have to watch out for to make sure I wasn't bribed? What kinds of things? If I told you stories you that I know, bring me money. I know personally about politicking that goes on sometimes in church groups, and you might guess what church I'm talking about. You would be shocked. Politics is a human disease, and it happens everywhere. And people are not above lying and doing all kinds of things to try to get where they, I mean, there's examples, I could give you many, of people who either, you know, clawed their way to the top, or other people who didn't get what they wanted and turned against the church, and all sorts of crazy <coughs> nonsense that's gone on. And you wonder how, why God allows that. I certainly do. So we should have picked people that cannot be bribed. That's, That's right. Motivates we can't like find Greek. anybody like that. <laughs> Look at the church that Jesus knew in Jerusalem. Yeah. Wow. But, but you know, this whole thing is kind of a precursor for the body of Christ, mm. if you think about it. Mm. We had the body of Christ, you know, with, with Christ at the head and, and all the members type of thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of the same mm -hmm. principle starting out there. That's uh, Ellen White said not only did they, did bribery and, for, uh, and fraud go on, but also murder in selecting the high priest. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, and, and let's just take an example. Um, in terms of the king, well you mentioned the high priest. Herod the Great's son, Archelaus, when he was, he was chosen to be the, the next leader of, of Judea, he was such a corrupt, such a mess, that just sort of to prove that he was the king and didn't, he wasn't going to bribe any, any nonsense, he killed 3,000 Jews when he came to office just to prove that he was boss. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the, the, there was such a hue and cry that the Romans sent a Roman person in to take charge of that position and that's why Pilate was the one there in charge when, when Jesus was crucified a few so years if, later. So if Christ is the, the head of the church, as was mentioned here at this table a moment ago, and uh, therefore that would mean I probably, if, if this is a comparison to, to the way Moses, if, if, if Moses kind of represented Christ in, in a way here, mm -hmm. then that would mean that in a way I have a relationship. I'm kind of a I'm kind of a judge in my own little world, mm -hmm. at, at my own little level, and I need to make sure that I don't take bribes, mm -hmm. and that I need to make sure that I'm honest in all that I do. Well, What's you're a representative. What's interesting is that one characteristic: a person that doesn't take a bribe. A person who takes a bribe is selfish, right? And that Satan's characteristic is selfish. Mm -hmm. And so when we have people that work on us in an evangelistic campaign, we have to make sure that they're not selfish. Mm -hmm. and but how, how do you know? Uh, what, what do you, uh, does this criteria, here's a, here's a biblical criteria, does this help us in picking out people in the church who are best suited to whatever job we need? Matthew 7, 17 and 18. A healthy tree bears good fruit, but a poor tree bears a bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a poor tree cannot bear good fruit. So therefore, what? Check the fruit. Any okay. tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Yeah. You know, one, one time in my life, for a very brief time, I found myself on a, I guess, a nominating committee. Mm -hmm. And I was given a, a bunch of names to call to see if they would these serve. people, and so on and so forth. And never was... Maybe the, maybe these instructions came along later on or something, but never was was uh, I was I instructed to r remind these people that they weren't supposed to take bribes or <laughs> or any anything like that. And 
<laughs> and you know, I think I could have called people myself. So it would be, it seems like it's very easy to almost overlook that when you're trying to. Especially when you're trying to find somebody to say yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've got this job you need to be filled. And oh, you got somebody. I be careful. Let's willing keep to take <laughs> almost anybody because if you don't, then you're going to have to do it yourself. But <laughs> well, I mean, these are, these are challenges. These sometimes can be very challenging. To I've served on a lot of nominating committees. So it 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 might be appropriate in this kind of a structure. Once these people, maybe before they have fully accepted to to come in and have a bit of an orientation about the kind of people that need well, to be Well, in, in light of this <coughs> quotation from the Bible we just read, would that mean if you pick somebody and he starts producing bad fruit while you, you discourage him from evangelizing? Well, if he's putting out bad fruit, isn't that yeah. kind of a thing you've got to do some ejection? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I remember last, in, the, in our last week's lesson, where this was kind of brought up, about embarking upon uh, using the new talents that you've been given because you use the last talents so well, and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're likely to make mistake. Well, not likely, but sometimes you do, and so you mm -hmm. pick yourself up and dust yourself off. So. How do we know this fruit, bad fruit that I've borne isn't a product of just simply my learning process? What did Jesus do when his disciples produced bad fruit? Because those disciples were not perfect to begin with. Is there a model there? Um, when we work uh, yeah. with people in evangelistic campaigns and did you plan to go this direction when you put your thoughts together on <laughs> the list? Yeah, partly. But they, but, but they dealt with Simon Magus when he wanted to get in there. Look at, look at, um, look at Matthew 17. You're talking about whether or not the, Jesus ever had to deal with the bad fruit. What, 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 what do you, how do you explain what happened here? Um, let's see. We need to be down here in... Um, this is what we need to do in evangelism. We need to know our Bible that good so when one, someone asks a question, spur of the moment, we can say, oh yes, and it's right here. <laughs> okay. Matthew 17, look at verse 14. Now, Jesus and, his, and three, his favorite three disciples, or the ones he chose anyway, who had been up on the mountain, they had been through the transfiguration experience, they had seen Moses and Elijah come down and that marvelous light show up and all that kind of stuff. They came down the mountain and what did they find? Well, this is what it says, starting with verse 14. When they returned to the crowd, a man came to Jesus, knelt before him and said, Sir, have mercy on my son. He is an epileptic and has such terrible fits that he often falls into the fire or into water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Now, these disciples had been given the power to heal, to raise people from the dead, and now they can't do anything. I have a theory on that. Okay. I think that... <laughs> do we need theories or do we need... Well, I'll see what you think about this. Okay. But <laughs> that Jesus and the three disciples disappeared. Mm -hmm. They're all worried about who's the greatest. Mm -hmm. Those three left with him, and now they're kind of steamed because they're down there by themselves. Yes. Okay, so now they've got the Spirit that's going to keep the Holy Spirit from their, mm -hmm. from doing their work. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is happening Yeah. There. That's good. Fair enough. Well, the man says, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus answered, how unbelieving and wrong you people are. How long must I stay with you? Does that sound... to the disciples there? Yeah, what about that? Does this sound like the language you'd expect from a loving Jesus? How long do I have to put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus gave a command to the demon, and it went out of the boy, and at that very moment he was healed. Now, Ellen White says that there were Jews around, probably some Pharisees who said, Aha, we have now found a case that Jesus can't, won't be able to heal. We're going to prove that this guy is a fraud, right? And what happens when he just gives a word and the boy is healed? Hmm. And the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked him, Why couldn't we drive the demon out? It was because you haven't enough faith answered Jesus. I assure you that if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can say to this hill, 
go from here to there and it will go. You could do anything. Now, another word for faith is you don't have enough trust in God. Mm -hmm. Trust. Okay. So what are we supposed to learn from that story? A faith that makes nothing impossible. Their faith must be strengthened by fervent prayer and fasting and humiliation of heart. They must be emptied of self and be filled with the spirit and power of God. Earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith. Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God and unreserved consecration to his work can alone avail to, to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in high places. Okay. Desire Reverence. of Ages 431. Okay. So, Ken, but it, it, look at that dedication, unreserved, mm -hmm. no self, total dependence. Mm -hmm. Those, that, that's, those are pretty lofty. Is that yeah, they how, are. Is that how you're supposed to get yourself before you try to witness, is to get yourself right with God, to pray, uh, humble yourself, ask for God to work through you before you even attempt to witness? Maybe that, would that be should a, be our prayer every morning. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Before we attempt to live? Before right. we attempt to do anything. Before we attempt to get out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Ken, you're... You're a physician. Gordon's a physician. So, having read all of this, Norm's a physician, and so on. We got a bunch of doctors around here. Some That's of us Dennis. are not doctors. Dennis is too. Dennis? So, so, <laughs> so, I can escape this now. But so tomorrow, why don't you just go out on the street corners out here and start preaching and healing? Yeah. If you heal people like, I mean, we just read here, it's all a matter of faith. Mm -hmm. um, so, why don't you do that? Well, and the implication I, I is that them. I should be able to do that yeah. too, but I, I have you a bigger excuse because I'm just a lowly teacher. I'm not well, a physician, yeah. so you've got <laughs> heads up on me here. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have asked the question a number of times. We're, we're living in the shadow of a great, the biggest health institution. Well, it may, maybe, maybe not quite the biggest, but one of the biggest health institutions, the Adventist Church around the world. Certainly the guiding light, we, we would say, with the medical school and everything here. Um, what would happen if uh, someone had this kind of ability that Jesus gave to his disciples and he walked into the university hospital over here someday and just walked through every ward and healed every person there. He would have the administration ready to crucify him. <laughs> no, he wouldn't. I, I, that's <laughs> what would happen to revenues. They would have to lock the doors. There'd be so many people at the door. Everybody in every hospital would want to be here instantly. They would have traffic cops out there trying to yeah. keep people from blocking the freeways. But yeah. we, we just read here that that if you've got that kind of faith and you're supposed to have that kind of faith, then you ought to be able to do it. Yes. And so now we're saying, well, we're not going to do it because, well, we'd have a big traffic jam. Let's, let's, <laughs> let, 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 let's come down to very practical issues now. Let's, let's talk about some. Some of us work in diverse communities. And we want to reach out to people and a variety of kind of people. And one of the things you need to recognize is on your team, if you're preparing to do evangelism, if you're going to have people who are going to work with Spanish-speaking people, for example, you better have some Spanish-speaking people to work with them. If you have single women, very likely you probably ought to have some single women who are working well to work with them. Couples, young couples, it would be nice to have young couples to work with them. It would be wonderful to find matching people in, in, that in, in life experiences and so forth and ages to the ones you're trying to evangelize. Even so, there's going to be problems that arise. Uh, look at Acts 6, 1 to 8. We've talked about this before, but sometime later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. 
The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of the funds. So the twelve disciples called the whole group of believers together and said, It is not right for us to neglect the preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. Who's supposed to handle the finances? The business people, right? So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you. <clears throat> Why did they choose seven? Perfect number, right? Who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching. The whole group was pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose, and here's a list of people with Greek names or Latin names. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicolaus, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Judaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. And so what happened? So the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. What group, what, what group generally did the priests priest belong to? Pharisees. More of them were actually Sadducees. Pre Pharisees and Sadducees. But at least the ones at the highest levels were Sadducees. Were there some Sadducees who became Christians? They'd have to change a lot of their beliefs. Yeah. Well, we know that Stephen and Philip at least became great evangelists themselves. So what, what do we learn from that principle? That, that story, what kind of principle should, could we take from that? Again, organization, uh, appointing good and wise people. And this is all about large corporate evangelism. No, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. It means even in a relatively small church, you should say, okay, let's get together and let's make plans. You know, so it's in such a person. You know, you're a single woman, okay? We're going to have you work with the single ladies. If, find someone that you'd like to witness to. Um, I'm an older white guy, so maybe I to witness to older white guys. You know, that kind of thing, uh, generally. You know, sure, you can have a big organized thing with, uh, maybe put up a tent and do all the old-fashioned Adventist stuff. But you don't have to do that, you know. Um, Small-scale stuff works fine. I've mentioned a book several times that I've read. It left an uh, impression uh, on me about evangelism mm -hmm. and the big tent, the public evangelism. Uh, the author cites is the last thing to be done. That there's so much work that needs to be done ahead of time mm -hmm. that that you that that future converts need on average five favorable encounters with members before public evangelism things like uh, uh, health uh, seminars and stop smoking clinics and and uh, financial restitution uh, seminars uh, social things, mm -hmm. just social events. We have a successful contact. They think, you know, those people are are not weird wackos. They're they're they're, they're, they're nice people to be around. Mm -hmm. What makes them tick? Well, and sometimes in preparation for evangelistic programs, people need to make personal sacrifices. Um, some very personal sacrifices. Look at Acts 16, 1 to 5, for example. Paul traveled on to Derby and Lystra, where a Christian named Timothy lived. His mother, who was also a Christian, was Jewish, but his father was a Greek. All the believers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted to take Timothy along with him. And where, what's Paul going to do? He's, this is a second missionary journey. What's he going to do? Go to more Jews. In he goes first places. in every new city he goes to. He goes first where? To the synagogue, right? Could you take Gentiles, uncircumcised Gentiles, into those kind of places? No. So what does Paul do? He says, Timothy, if you want to come with me, you need to be circumcised. Not an easy thing for a young man to do. Well, he did it. Timothy agreed. He did so because all the Jews who lived in those places knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. 
As they went through the towns, they, deliver, they delivered to the believers the rules decided upon by the apostles and so forth. Um, Barnabas is another example. Look at Acts 4, starting with verse 36. And so was it Joseph, a Levite born in Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means one who encourages, sold a field he owned, to brought the money and handed it over to the apostles to help fund things that need to be done to promote evangelism. Um, what other kinds of personal sacrifices might we need to make? Time. Do you think those personal sacrifices actually hurt? Is that yeah. the kind of sacrifice you're talking about? I mean, is it possible that they were willing to do all that stuff huh? excitingly? Mm -hmm. Does it, does it? <laughs> I, I don't know that you would so Pardon my grammar. Well, as a personal <laughs> sacrifice that you, it hurts, is that better than a certain personal sacrifice that... Well, that's my question. I mean, I mean, when you say personal sacrifice, are you talking about something that you're getting whipped over? Or is well, it something yeah, that it's might it's be... Uh, I think, <laughs> I think the, the, the widow's two mites was an example of... She gave the last two mites that she had. She gave everything. She didn't know where her next meal was coming from. Mm -hmm. The rich guys were pouring in their buckets and blowing the trumpets and all of that. Which one did God choose? Mm -hmm. But um, are you saying that one is a sacrifice and the other wasn't? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, what about uh, what about when this evangelism is successful, mm -hmm. and you have some new people that come in to the church now, and now you have to train them. nurture these people. Train them. You have to take They're time out of your routine. Yeah. And you have to be nice to these people and mm. and nurture them. And well, you have to watch over them for one you thing. You know, yeah. I would I, disagree about that sacrifice. I think those rich people giving money is a sacrifice also. It's mm -hmm. just that the lady made a, a proportionately bigger sacrifice. But where would the church be without those... Um, mm non-thinking, rich people. I mean, uh, they could be spending that money uh, buying a yacht. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a sacrifice too. Maybe I misspoke. But there's a, there's a relative pain. Mm -hmm. uh, those who have lots of money can give a big piece and, and it doesn't hurt. It, it, they can, so it's got to be pain. There's no, got to be pain. I, I, think <laughs> it, I think there's part of that, that that is exactly right, that that God respects those who who are totally dedicated to his per, to His purpose. Why do you suppose Jesus commended the woman who gave those two little... You know, I traveled to Jerusalem for the first time about, what, maybe 40 years ago now, and um, a young kid came along and sold me a little tiny copper thing that was, boy, just about, I suppose, a half a centimeter across, and he told me this was a mite. And you could see a little bit of something, somebody had done something on this copper thing, and maybe it was, I don't know. But, you know, a little tiny bit of a thing like that couldn't have been worth a whole lot. And this woman gave two, and Jesus commended her. Why did he commend her? Well, on the other hand, if you have a person that has two million dollars and that's mm -hmm. all he's got, and you have a widow with two mites, mm -hmm. and the the one with two million gives everything, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of proportional. I mean, it's proportionally oh, different, I, but I think the the um, I think I think in God's sight that might be equal. That might be equal. Yeah. Not they because both, of the both amount, gave, but no, because it's not of the, the amount. Like it's it's yeah. it, it's relative to what to the sacrifice that each makes. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take another example from the life of Jesus that we're encouraged to look at. Look at John chapter 7, starting with verse 14. The festival, now remember what had happened. Jesus had been up in Galilee. His brothers and his mother came along and they said, you know, if you're supposed to be the Messiah, we, we, you know, we're, we're starting to get this idea that you're supposed to be the Messiah. And you know, Messiah is supposed to take charge. You go down to Jerusalem and Tell them who you are and get on with it. Well, the festival is near, and, and Jesus said, no, you go on down, your time hasn't come yet. I mean, you, I mean, you can go anytime, it doesn't matter. My time has not yet come. And then he took a back route, and all of a sudden he arrived in Jerusalem, appeared at the temple, and starts preaching. 
starts teaching. The festival was nearly half over when Jesus went to the temple and began teaching. The Jewish authorities were greatly surprised and said, how does this man know so much when he has never had any training? What are they saying? We didn't teach him. We didn't teach him. He didn't go to one of our schools. Jesus answered, what I teach is not my own teaching, but it comes from God who sent me. Where did Jesus get his education? His mother and talking with his father every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Certainly in the early years, I'm sure that's true, but later on, I think he got a lot of his education when he was out mm -hmm. there all night with his father. Well, by the time he was 12, he was asking questions that amazed the experts yeah. in Jerusalem. By the time he was 12. I'd like to read you a few words from Ellen White that, that, that I think say something, because we're talking about the making the final preparations, the training that we need to, to get inspired to go out and move. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. Incredible, huh? As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. How did that work? Well, so that is a good um, example of homeschooling with a uh, good parent leader or uh, support system can really work just as well, if not better, than the school system. Mm -hmm. Well, that was Desire of Ages, page 70, the first paragraph, and I'm going to read a, read a little bit more. Thus to Jesus, the significance of the word and the works of God was unfolded as he was trying to understand the reason of things. Heavenly beings were his attendants, and the culture of holy thoughts and communings was his. From the first dawning of intelligence, he was constantly growing in spiritual grace and knowledge of truth. This sounds like, in addition to his mother, he was taught by God and by the angels. Joseph and Mary hoped that he might be led to reverence the learned rabbis but, and give more diligent heed to their requirements. But Jesus in the temple had been taught by God. That which he received, he began at once to impart. And if I had time to read on, you would say, she goes on to say, and every child can learn as Jesus did. So when we have the heart that we want to go out and witness or evangelize, if we allow the time and, and study and going out in nature, are you saying that God and holy beings will help educate us? Sounds like it. Yeah. That's like the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. He's, char he's, he's in charge of that work. What you're speaking of. He's in charge of that work. But those who make no decided effort but simply wait for the Holy Spirit to compel them to action, will perish in darkness. You are not to sit still and do nothing in the work of God. Mm -hmm. Revelation. Just sitting mm -hmm. there and waiting for inspiration. That's right. Saying, well, God, give me the inspiration. Right. Well, what, what exactly is she saying there? She's saying that in order to have your heart, mind, and soul enveloped in the work of God, it's going to take everything you've got. You mm -hmm. can't be, be half-hearted waiting for the Holy Spirit to dump on you something. It, it takes the effort. Mm -hmm. it's, in that, it's, it's in that effort of trying to make the connection with Him that, that it can come. Yeah. Revelation 1.3 says, Happy and blessed are those who read those who listen to the words spoken, and those who obey what is written. Well, that's quite a sentence. Yeah. Obey equals do. Well, read, listen, and obey. Yeah. And in those days, remember, not many people were able to read. So the person who was able to read got up and he read it, and the rest of them, the rest of them listened. Mm -hmm. But then he expected everybody to go out and do something. Well, if we go, if, is it true that if we go forth to, to doing our very best to witness, we will be blessed with guidance by the Holy Spirit and her knowledge and skills will improve? Yes. I think that's exactly what that's God exactly says. Right. 
So we can count on God for that as we try our best. Yep. So you're, you're kind of saying here that we've got to get out of our groove somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, out of our normal way of doing things, our niche or whatever, and, and say, okay, let's try this out. Let's test this and see if it works. Remember the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus sat down by the well. Here's this woman who no doubt came in the middle of the day because she had a bad reputation and she didn't want people asking her too many questions, so she wanted to come to the well, not at the time when all the rest of the women came to the well, but she was there in the middle of the day. And Jesus engaged her in conversation, asked for a drink. And of course, that is that exchange. And finally, pretty soon she gets real excited and she charges off into town. And what do you think she said when she got to town? Could he be the Messiah? Come see someone who told me everything I ever did. And the people in town, do you think they had any idea about her past? Yes. They said, hmm, this guy must be something, right? We better go figure this out. She says, you know, and if they qu questioned any of her, what did she just say next? Come and see. Come and see. Well, the other weird, the other interesting thing is she seemed to lose her embarrassment over all the things that she ever did. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so, that's kind of puzzling. Uh -huh. So, um, I think that story of the, good, of the Samaritan woman is in John 4. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. She surely wasn't threatened by Jesus. No, no, no. She felt accepted. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. Uh -huh. he, did, he didn't whip her over the head because of what she was doing. Um, in Acts 1, 15 to 26, just to pick another story from the Bible, a few days later there was a meeting of the believers. Now this is, you know, there Jesus is dead. Now he's re he's resurrected. They know that they've had they met with him two or three times. A few days later there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 all, and Peter stood up to speak. My fellow believers, he said, the scripture had to come true in which the Holy Spirit, speaking through David, made a prediction about Judas, and of course goes on. I'm going to skip over a few verses. Uh, they had to pick out somebody to take Judas's place. Verse 21, so then someone must join us as a witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He must be one of the men who are in our group during the whole time that the Lord Jesus traveled about with us, beginning from the time John preached his message of baptism until the day Jesus was taken up from us to heaven. Now, what does that imply about who was where and what were they doing? It implies there were a lot more than 12 men yes. traveling with Jesus. Do we know about any others that were traveling with Jesus? A bunch of women. Where did you get that idea? Luke 8, I think it is. Luke 8. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 disciples went with him and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband was Chusa, was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Hmm. So not only were there a number of men, but there are also a number of women, apparently, that were associated with Jesus on a regular basis. Do you think the 12 disciples knew that they were the select 12? Yes. Jesus, Jesus picked them out and named them, yeah. But remember, a little while later in Luke 10, 1 to 12, he talks about picking out 72 and sending them, sending them out into Gentile areas two by two. So it was probably one of those 72 that ended up, well, two of those 72, probably the two that were chosen there, and they chose one of them. And do you, what about the other one? Do you think he stopped witnessing because he wasn't chosen? No. I very sincerely doubt it. Well, it was it. a position of responsibility, and maybe mm -hmm. um, he didn't want it, too. But it's true, and we have to admit that it's true, when, when someone in a church group says, okay, it's time for us to do something, everybody says, well, because we're shaking people up out of their comfort zone, right? And they're busy. And they're busy. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah. So when you decide, okay, now we're going to try something we haven't done before, how does that make people feel? Change always brings fear. Mm -hmm. 
Leaders yeah. can either inspire or they can worry. Mm -hmm. So um, people were ready to follow some of our founding fathers and... Does that mean they can also cause worry leaders? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they don't get ulcers, they give them both. <laughs> well, we've already talked about in the past uh, the story of Paul and Barnabas who had a marvelous first missionary journey together and John Mark turned back and when they start out on the second mission, or ready to start on the second missionary journey, Paul says, I'm headed off, you want to go with me? And Barnabas says, well, let's take John Mark. And Paul says, nothing doing. You know, that guy, he was a flake. He quit in the middle of the, none of that kind of stuff. And he wrote the Gospel of Mark later, didn't he? And he, he? wrote the bo Gospel of Mark and probably used the teachings of, 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 of uh, Peter. Peter to do that. Well, how did, how did, what do we know about Jesus' attitude about John Mark later? Just, I'm mean, sorry, Paul's. Paul's attitude to John Mark later. Look at 2 Timothy 4.11. Only Luke was with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. So, you know, there may be bumps. There may be hindrances along the way. But, and, and people, some people may get discouraged. Some people you work with are diamonds in the rough. Mm -hmm. well, in the case of Mark, it was Paul that got discouraged. Mm -hmm. Good old Saint Paul, who mm -hmm. was the paragon of, yes. of Christian evangelism. <laughs> okay. Well, what differences in your church at Sabbath School might be hindering the progress toward witnessing and evangelism? Do we need a little more humility? Even death to self? Willingness to forgive? Even turning the other cheek? I think we need enthusiasm and the ability to not sleep through the Sabbath school mm -hmm. and, and just to <laughs> get involved. And excitement Great. grows and people want to be where interesting things are happening. Yeah. You know, I. I, I mentioned from time to time about small churches. Um, I, I just reflect a little bit on some of the, you know, um, I wonder sometimes if smaller churches aren't trying to do things on a big church level. Mm. Mm. And, uh, you know, the service has to be a certain way or this is the way it ought to be and so on and so forth. And they're so, they don't have the, the personnel or the staff, uh, you know, and everybody gets overworked trying to do more because they think this is the way it's supposed to be. And then when anything new comes along, they just, they're just, you know, worn out, so to mm. speak. Uh, kind of spiritually is the wrong word, but in a way it's kind of yeah. the right word. I, I wonder if, 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 um, if that is a case in, in smaller churches, some smaller churches, maybe they need to not try to, to undertake such things on such a, a, large, a large scale. Well, maybe churches these churches always have this out here beyond their, mm -hmm. you know, thinking they ought to have a choir when they don't have a choir or, you know, I don't know. You probably know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Well, it's interesting if you, studies have been done on churches, not just in Adventist churches, but other kinds of churches, and the churches that are most alive and really doing something are somewhere in the range of, of 100 to 250, maybe up to 500 members. You get a lot bigger than that, and it's, it's awful easy to just sort of get lost in the crowd. And you're not really a part of it. Uh, you get yeah. churches that are smaller than that, and sort of, you know, you, you may not have many people who feel qualified to lead and and they tend to be a little bit sleepy and not much is happening and so yeah but these days you know we have this this growth in mega churches mm. where it, it seems to me like it's just a giant program yeah well you, they you, collect a lot of money on them, you got you know? you're in there competing with television right they got you got to put on a tv style program it's got to be a big um, production, a big, a big thing, and uh, we we seem to want things 
at a high level, even though we may not be intimately involved because we're part of this group, vicariously, we sense a feel of, of great belonging and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but another thing that could happen is that some members can get really creative as far as their outreach goes. It could be different than they've ever seen before, and people get nervous about that. Mm -hmm. I remember one small church, the music director of the small church thought she would have a concert where she'd invite other music people from other denominations in. And, um, and they actually got excited about doing that, but there were some people in the church that didn't think we should be doing that, and the whole thing got killed, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, what needs to happen to Organize for Witnessing? The church needs to decide which people will be involved, how they will be involved, and how the program must be laid out. So you've got to have goals. You've got to get all that started. Two, a definite timeline should be developed. We make it as detailed as you like. It should include specific training for certain programs, in, including actual start and finish dates, and, and then time allowed for evaluation at the end. Three, we should try to make it clear who is responsible for doing each particular task. Four, look carefully at how your program fits in with other church programs. Uh, you want to minimize the conflict. You, know, you don't want to be doing an evangelistic series right in the middle of the Christmas program or something like that, you know, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. So you want to try to avoid conflict with other programs because you know, that, that engenders trouble. Five, you must think carefully about uh, whether you want to have an ongoing program that never stops, it just sort of feeds on itself, or do you want to have a like a year-long program, and then you stop and you evaluate and you think, and then you start over again and do a, another year-long program. Um, Where did you get this list? How did you, how'd you arrive at this list? Well, this is a list based on something that was in the Sabbath School Quarterly. Okay. Yeah. Well, could you bring in um, recognized, uh, in our case, denominational um, uh, leaders that are not normally with your congregation, and not necessarily just for evangelism, but, but for spiritual nourishment. Sure, absolutely. Um, someone who's a noted theologian or, or known, you know, is a, a, an authority or considered a, an authority on righteousness by faith, and, and pull this person in for a, a week of spiritual renewal. It may be clear from across the country, but... Mm -hmm. um, well... Look at these words from Mellon White again. This is in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 30. God expects personal service from everyone to whom he has entrusted the knowledge of the truth for this time. How many are included? Everyone. everyone. Not all can go as missionaries to foreign lands, but all can be home missionaries in their families and neighborhoods. There are many ways in which church members may give the message to those around them. One of the most successful is by living helpful, unselfish Christian lives. And then another one similar. To everyone who becomes a partaker of his grace, the Lord appoints a work for others. Individually, we are to stand in our lot saying, Here am I, send me. Prophets and Kings, page 222. What does that tell us? We are to get involved. We yeah. are not to be a pew sitter. Yeah, or, or a comfortable Christian. A comfortable Christian. <laughs> Do we believe these words? Do we know how and what we need to discover, what role God wants us to play in this evangelism? Or is there a feeling among those in your church that the pastors is so much better? You know, we need to pee, have people who are professionally trained. You know, the one who sings, we want a professional singer. You know, that kind of stuff. How can we overcome that kind of an obstacle? Another uh, obstacle is someone that won't delegate and won't mm -hmm. let other people participate because they want to do it all. So it can go both ways. Yeah. How do we discover, without judging or being judgmental, um, what Jay's talents are, your talents? How, how do you, you go around a church and say, I mean, do you choose a committee to, to, to figure out what talents everybody has? Is that the work of the nominating committee? 
Some churches have an organized, actually a class where you determine your gifts. And that really is helpful to people mm -hmm. because other people tell them what they think they're good at. And that way, then they have a list and they say, okay, these are my gifts. Well, the time has come for us to put theory into practice. For those who have been involved in the past, there was a great thrill in watching someone you have worked with actually become a member of the church. Talk with other members of your Sabbath school class or with your church to think about the obstacles which might be hindering your particular church from reaching out. One of the greatest obstacles in our day is the problem of time. We've mentioned this, at least in passing, several times. So many people are incredibly busy. Why are we so busy? I think the devil uh, arranges that yes. uh, by making us selfish, uh, keep up with this or that or, or whatever, that uh, we, we, we just don't have time. And as a result, less than 40%, and I'm surprised it's even that high, of, according to the Adventist World Survey of 2002, of church members were engaged in sharing their faith. Well, you know, now the young students can do it through their technology, even though they like to be connected all the time. That is another way they can witness, is through mm -hmm. that same technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the Adventist Church is in the middle of a long discussion about the role of women in ministry. And I would like to just, in, as, we're, as we're bringing things to conclusion, read a couple of passages. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I recommend to you our sister Phoebe, who serves a church at Sancria. Receive her in the Lord's name as God's people should, and give her any help she may need from you. For she herself has been a good friend to many people and also to me. And another passage that's maybe a little more typical of things the way they are. Euodia and Yusintiki, please, I beg you, try to agree as sisters in the Lord. And you too, my faithful partner, I want you to help those, these women, for they have worked hard with me to spread the gospel, together with Clement and all my other fellow workers, whose names are in God's book of the living. So there are many ways in which we need to reach out and, and, and try to, to, well, really honestly, to get out of our comfort zone Christianity. Our confessions of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We've suggested that before, but we need to do it. We need to learn from it. We need to get out and tell people what we've done in the past and encourage them to get involved so they can witness. And we hope that will be your experience. See you next week.